House Government Reform and Oversight Committee continues its investigation of the White House Travel Office. Wednesday, there was testimony from the seven former employees fired by the White House in 1993. Witnesses included Billy Dale, former director of the White House Travel Office. Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order uh, as we uh, did at the last uh, hearing in this matter. We will, I will give an opening statement and I will then recognize Mrs. Collins for an opening statement. Others who wish to have opening statements may submit them for the record or uh, use part of their time uh, during the question period to, to make those uh, statements. So what? We have been hearing from many of my Democratic colleagues over the past few weeks in regard to this investigation. So what if the White House fired the travel office employees and high-ranking officials failed to tell the real story to numerous investigators or provided, quote, vague and protective information, to use Mr. Watkins' word, about the real reasons for the firings and thwarted countless attempts to get at the truth and really wasted taxpayer dollars on incomplete investigations? So what? If the new administration wanted to throw contracts to their friends and get a good press story, again as stated by David Watkins, by alleging wrongdoing by the former staff. So what if the White House learned that Harry Thomason's allegations of kickbacks and bribes were false and perhaps slanderous, but failed to include this information in the White House Management Review and, in fact, removed this exculpatory information from a draft report of that Management Review? So what? If the FBI and the IRS were enlisted to harass seven innocent people by Clinton uh, cronies peddling false allegations of kickbacks and bribes, the White House talking points are being dutifully followed by a so what chorus, and now the administration is hauling out a whole new collection of carefully crafted and I might say lawyerly non-denial denials. The blasé attitude adopted by my colleagues uh, is a striking change from the past when even the whiff of trouble would have put them into investigative overdrive. So what? These seven men here today are the so what? So what? These seven men are here to tell them their side of the story, to give them and their wives and their children and their families an opportunity to have their story told. Uh, as an Arkansas paper described the scenario, quote, the Clintons took Billy Dale's job crashed his reputation, sick the FBI on him, and ruined him financially. And still they won't leave him alone to cover up this ham-handed combination of arrogance and ineptitude the White House accused Dale of embezzlement, close quote. The editorial page editor of the Washington Post, Meg Greenfield, said this was, quote, the worst kind of unfounded and destructive assault on innocent people, people who could have been replaced in a straightforward way. This was not, in other words, just an act of so-called cronyism, close quote. What we will see and here today is an administration's arrogance and really ruthlessness brought to light by seven people who worked hard and played by the rules. Fortunately, in the end, our judicial system worked for these people, but not without a significant personal and financial cost to themselves. Mr. Dale has amassed almost a half a million dollars in legal fees to defend himself against this continuing assault. Mr. McSweeney estimates he spent almost $60,000 Mr. Van Eymeren, 35,000, Mr. Drelinger, 34,000, Mr. Mom, 44,000, Mr. Brasso, 20,000, and Mr. Wright, 6,000. Their families have suffered countless indignities for being in the wrong place at the wrong time when ambitious friends of Bill wanted to, quote, take advantage of Washington opportunities, close quote, as stated in a memo from one friend of Bill, Darnell Martins, to another, Harry Thomason. Unfortunately today, the Clinton administration and its highly paid surrogates continue their campaign to scapegoat the former travel office employees while ignoring the possibility of wrongdoing by administration officials and powerful political supporters. This wrongdoing appears to include a pattern of withholding relevant documents and pertinent facts from numer numerous previous investigations. And this wrongdoing may include the abuse of the FBI and IRS to advance the fortunes of friends and family at the expense of innocent bystanders, an area this committee will explore in subsequent hearings. Let me apologize in advance to the witnesses for what may be, hopefully not, but could be continued attacks today. But please understand from whence they come. These attacks are coming from those who apparently think it is fine to call in the FBI and IRS on the merest hint of rumors. These attacks have, have come in the past from those who have ignored real travel scandals 
such as Secretary Hazel O'Leary's $250,000 of unaccounted for taxpayer funds and Secretary Ron Brown's $24 million in overspending for travel and $360,000 in unreimbursed advanced travel expenses. At the Commerce Department, we now know hundreds of employees misuse government credit cards for personal expenses ranging from jewelry to car insurance, according to an internal audit from the Commerce IG's office. So please take the attacks, if there are any, uh, with somewhat of a grain of salt. I know that for most of you it must be strange to be at the center of this firestorm. You dutifully served the government for years, far from the spotlight, and this was not a stage you would have sought. It is a tribute to you that after a 30-month investigation, the Justice Department could not really come up with any uh, neighbors or friends or colleagues who had anything but the highest regards for you all. At Mr. Dale's trial, ABC's Sam Donaldson told the jury that Billy Dale was a, quote, totally honest man. I've known him for 20 years, and he's a man of high integrity, testified LA Times Jack Nelson. And the president of the White House Correspondents Association, the group whose funds Mr. Dale was accused of stealing, also testified on his behalf. What is often overlooked is that tax money, tax money was not involved in any way in the travel office. As a reporter recently pointed out to Press Secretary Mike McCurry, quote, this was all news media money. And as far as I know, no one in the news media has complained about any mismanagement, whatever. So why was there this great concern, close quote. Fortunately, Mr. Billy Dale, the former director of the travel office, is with us today and did not have to read about the long-withheld Watkins memo or other long-withheld White House documents from a jail cell where this administration really was trying to send him for 20 years. His six former colleagues, Gary Wright, John McSweeney, John Drelinger, Barney Brousseau, Ralph Maum, and Bob Van Imeren, also join us today. All seven of these individuals were subjected for the, first, for the past 30 months to all the might of the federal government including Justice Department public integrity prosecutors, FBI agents, and IRS agents roaming their neighborhoods, culling through their financial records, and interviewing themselves and their families. It's important to note that the White House not only denied this committee and the independent counsel long sought documents, but it also failed to turn over to criminal investigators relevant documents that would have possibly been exculpatory material, material that Mr. Dale may have been entitled to uh, during his trial. The Justice Department has only recently admitted to us that they were very disturbed by the lack of White House cooperation with the criminal investigation into the White House Travel Office matter. Documents about Harry Thomason were withheld for almost a year, long after commitments had been made to public integrity that all documents had been turned over. Former Interior Secretary James Watt pleaded recently to withholding documents from a grand jury. A person may be held in contempt of Congress under 2 U.S.C. 192 for refusing to produce documents or records. In fact, three Reagan administration officials prosecuted by Iran-Contra Independent Counsel Lawrence Welch, Elliot Abrams, Alan Fears, and Robert McFarlane pled guilty to withholding information from Congress. Of course, we may never really know what happened to many of the documents in the travel office because both the White House and the FBI demonstrated a true case of quote, abysmal mismanagement uh, in the handling of this investigation, the very thing that the travel office employees were charged with. In short, the White House withheld documents and dragged out document production, and the FBI and Justice, Depart Justice Department at best looked the other way too often. Travel office records began to be removed from the travel office shortly after a presidential cousin, Catherine Cornelius, began working in the travel office in April 1993. Senior White House officials knew that Catherine Cornelius was taking home documents from the travel office, and the record of what documents ever made it back to the White House is sketchy at best. The prosecution, notably, did not call Ms. Cornelius as a witness. When the White House sent in Pete Marwick to do a quick review, stress review, this was not an audit, the documents were handed over to Patsy Thomason at the conclusion of that review. Mrs. Thomason just happens to be the individual whom the White House described just last week as having, quote, hopelessly messy files, close quote. Mr. Watkins, her supervisor, testified last week that he had no idea what she did with the travel office records provided to Pete Marwick. The very re revealing Watkins memo was found in Ms. Thomason's, quote, messy file. Ms. Thomason, who played a key role in firing the employees, also was not called by the prosecution. Mr. Watkins, the individual who communicated the firings to these employees, was himself fired 
for taking a White House helicopter on a midweek golfing trip. The prosecution didn't call Mr. Watkins as a witness either. When the Justice Department went to trial in the case of U.S. versus Billy Dale, they had to concede that many records that they knew had once existed were missing and unaccounted for. The FBI took almost a month to get into the White House and secure any documents. We have heard no plausible explanation for this long delay in securing the records. Now, we have again just learned from the Justice Department that many of the documents that they supposedly had obtained from the White House never actually left the White House compound and were instead maintained at the White House. Finally, the head of the White House Records Management Office raised red flags to Staff Secretary John Podesta that documents were being tampered with and improperly handled in the days following the firings. Even worldwide travel employees who came in from Arkansas to assist in the travel office firing were concerned with documents being trashed in the office. The notes from the White House Management Review are full of questions asking where the documents were, but Mr. Podesta, who was put in charge of the White House Management Review, failed to include this information in his uh, report. As we had heard earlier when we reviewed all of the reports and all of the investigations that had been done, uh, none of them were really thorough because most of them had no access to many of the documents that have only just come to light. So it seems a due process and integrity of records stopped at the White House door. Why were the Justice Department and the FBI willing to suspend normal practices when the White House was involved? Is the highest office in the land given a pass on normal criminal investigative procedures? So as a result of our investigation so far, as it is so far, it is clear to me the alleged concern about financial mismanagement that we've heard often in the past few weeks was always a cover for a decision that had been made long before Pete Marwick ever crossed the threshold of the White House. As David Watkins testified last week and as his notes revealed, on May 12, 1993, two full days before Pete Marwick came in, the First Lady expressed her wishes to Harry Thomason that the travel office employees all be fired that day. One week later, on May 19, 1993, D.D. Myers claimed on behalf of the White House that the seven travel office employees had been fired based on a report which did not exist of an audit which never occurred. Pete Marwick documents we have received from the White House as well as uh, Vince Foster's notes indicate involvement of the White House in dictating the terms of the Pete Marwick review and editing of that review. In other words, this much touted audit was actually a non-independent, non-audit. Mr. Larry Herman, who headed up the review, told committee staff of pressure on Pete Marwick to finish the review quickly once they had cited it as justification for the firings. No doubt this was so the White House could substantiate their claims of financial mismanagement. The Pete Marwick report itself never once, never once mentions the words abysmal mismanagement, gross mismanagement, or any of the other pejoratives that have been uh, bandied about. And Mr. Herman, the man who was in charge of the uh, review, told the committee he would not use such terms. In fact, Mr. Herman told GAO investigators uh, during their review that he was surprised by the decision to fire the employees before the review was even completed, and he told the committee that he himself did not think his review warranted the firings. Frankly, I've been disappointed in the total refusal of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to approach this investigation with any semblance of an open mind. As my colleague Mr. Shays noted in our last hearing, many of us have sat through countless investigations when our colleagues were in the majority, and in many, if not most cases, worked in a bipartisan manner, even when it hurt our own party. As Meg Greenfield pointed out earlier this week, there does not need to be a murder mystery to warrant serious review of a matter by Congress. Just this morning, we all honored one of our colleagues, former Congressman Mike Sinar, who passionately and aggressively pursued various investigations in this committee. And I believe I worked in a bipartisan fashion with uh, Mike in many of those investigations when Republicans were in the White House and have tried to continue that spirit as chairman. Abuse of power is always an important and relevant issue in a government that is the size of the government of the United States of America. Giving these individuals the opportunity to tell the American people the really unfortunate truth about how they were mistreated and maligned by this administration is long past due. So I welcome the gentleman here this morning, and I would now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Mrs. Collins, for any opening statement she might care Thank to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand your interest in permitting these seven individuals to tell their stories. 
and in particular to allow Mr. Dale the opportunity to respond to the various charges that have been raised against him. These, of course, include the findings of financial mismanagement made in the Peak Mark Review, as well as his activities uh, that provided probable cause for a grand jury to indict him of criminal charges for embezzling funds. However, I question what this has to do with your stated purpose of this committee's investigation into the travel office. You have repeatedly assured us that your only intent is to find out the facts about the firings of the travel office staff. None of these witnesses have any first-hand knowledge about the findings, about their firings. And they've already said that. In fact, Mr. Dale, who headed the travel office, stated as much in this article in the Washington Post on Sunday when he wrote, and I quote, to begin with, I do not know who gave the order to fire me or my six colleagues, end quote. Now, I think we have to be very careful that in attempting to repair the damage done to the reputation of these individuals, that we did not impugn the integrity of the career prosecutors of the Department of Justice or the professionals of Pete Marwick. There have been suggestions that the career public integrity section prosecutors with the Department of Justice were somehow pressured by the White House into indicting Mr. Dale. Similarly, the Pete Marwick team has been accused of trumping up its findings of financial mismanagement at the urging of the White House. Now, since we have seen no evidence to support these charges, these individuals must also be given a chance to tell their side of the story under oath. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, in order to allow both the Justice Department and Pete Marwick to respond to these very serious charges, I am today requesting that you schedule a hearing and call representatives from the department and the auditing firm. As has been said over and over again by members of this committee and by the administration, the firing of the travel office employees was terribly mishandled. Although the president was indeed entitled to hire his own people for the travel office, just as the chairman was allowed to fire the entire nonpartisan clerical staff of this committee when he became chairman, his handling was dead wrong. Mr. Dale's article raises many questions about both the financial management of the travel office and the financial practices that led to his indictment. Let me be absolutely clear about this because there seems to be some confusion. The Pete Mark Review made a number of observations and findings of, quote, significant accounting system weaknesses. Well, let me quote from its findings. In particular, they say, we observe several significant weaknesses in the existing internal control system of the press office. So what? Well, here's what. According to the Pete Mark Review, those weaknesses include, quote, lack of accountability, lack of accounting controls and systems, lack of documentation, lack of contractual support, and an inadequate billing process, end quote. According to Pete Marwick, Mr. Dale himself admitted to their auditors that he withheld an envelope full of cash during the first day of the review. And I'm quoting from an FBI review uh, with Pete Mark, quote, quoting now, Mr. Dale, because he knew it would not look good and it reflected that he had done a poor job of accounting, end quote. Now, Mr. Dale states in the Post article that the most serious issue raised by the Pete Mark team was his failure to record certain petty cash checks. So the public understands what this means. Let me briefly explain that, too. Now, when Mr. Dale or other authorized travel office employees withdrew funds from the travel office bank account to be used for petty cash expenses on a trip, he would make a, a check out to cash and then record that amount into the petty cash ledger. ledger. Now, Pete Marikauer found that in numerous uh, cases, checks made out to cash were never actually entered into the petty cash ledger. According to what the Pete Mark, um, uh, Mark auditors told the FBI, Mr. Dale could not explain these discrepancies. FBI investigators have told committee staff 
that these discrepancies coupled with the fact that Mr. Dale appeared on the second day of the review with $2,800 in cash, which he said accounted for some of the missing petty cash, gave them a sufficient reason to open a criminal investigation. However, from an auditor's point of view, this was not a most serious finding. The most serious charge was the travel officer's lack of accountability. So what? Here's what. Pete Marwick found a lack of accounting controls, no formal financial reporting process, no reconciliation of financial information. I even reconciled my bank account, my checkbook account. No documentation system of checks and balances of transactions. Who ever heard of such a thing in accounting decisions? And no oversight of review of financial activities. Lack of accountability may, not, may also have resulted in such abuses of fundamental common sense in placing checks to the travel office directly into Mr. Dale's personal checking account. Again, let me make this clear so that the public understands this. So what, here's what. One of the reasons that Mr. Dale came under suspicion from the prosecutors was for placing a total of $54,000 of travel office funds into his personal checking account, a practice his own attorney characterized as, quote, a disastrous business judgment. So in closing now, let me again note that all of us on this committee have great empathy for the five lower level employees. Now, I'm sorry for what they've gone through, and I hope that there are lessons not only for future White Houses, but for future Congresses as well when they fire nonpartisan career staff. Mr. Dale, I say, you have also been through a great deal of suffering, and a jury has found you not guilty of criminal charges. Now, normally, that would be the end of the matter. But the chairman has convened this committee hearing to look into the circumstances of your firing. And I hope that today's hearing will provide you with another opportunity to respond to the various allocations made by the GAO, Pete Marwick, and the Public Integrity Section concerning the management, and I use the word loosely, of the travel office, and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentlelady, and in response to your request uh, for uh, having the Dust Department here, I think we certainly are willing to take that under advisement. I would, however, uh, remind the gentlelady uh, that uh, we have been requesting documents uh, with regard to this matter from the Justice Department for some time. We still do not have the documentation we would need, which we would need to have prior to a hearing, but as soon as those documents are forthcoming, we would certainly take that request under advisement. I think we're now prepared to uh, invite our witnesses to come forward to the, uh, to the witness table, if you would, uh, gentlemen. And if you want to stand, and as you probably know, it's a custom, have a custom of this committee to swear all of our witnesses so that no witness is prejudiced in any way. So if you have no objection, I would ask you to raise your right hand. If you swear that the testimony you're about to give to this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. I do. Let the record indicate that uh, all of the witnesses uh, answered in the affirmative. And with that, gentlemen, if you will take your seat and uh, welcome you all here. Um, and I'm going to, first of all, uh, start out with the, with the former head of the travel office, uh, uh, Mr. Billy Dale, if you would uh, proceed with your testimony, Mr. Dale. You can summarize it or give it in full or however you want to proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, committee members, and council. My name is Billy Dale, and I am the former director of the White House Telegraph and Travel Office. It is with great relief that I sit with you this morning to tell my side of the story about the scandal and abuse of political power now popularly referred to as Travelgate. For nearly 32 years, I worked in the White House Travel Office as, it direct, as its director for the last 11. During that time, my colleagues and I carried out the rigorous task of arranging for the press to accompany and cover the President of the United States as he traveled this nation and around the world. Through several administrations, we functioned as an efficient, effective organization, serving the President without regard to partisanship. In fact, I had faithfully served seven presidents prior to Mr. Clinton. And even though I was ready for retirement, 
my colleagues would have gladly continued in that role for him throughout his entire administration. But that was not to be. As the Clinton campaign, transition teams, and the Clinton administration had other designs on the White House Travel Office. During the two and a half years between May 19, 1993, and the day, I was, the day I was fired from my position as director of the Travel Office, and the day I finally got to testify at my trial to defend myself against the false charge that I embezzled money from the press, I did not attempt to answer that charge or any of the other false charges that were leveled at me concerning my management of the travel office. It was not easy for me or my family. We were subjected to the most intense intrusions and harassment you can imagine. We were sustained during those very difficult times by our faith and the many friends and professional colleagues who stood by our side. I had hoped that after the jury found me not guilty so quickly, we could return to the very quiet and simple life we used to live. However, since the release of David Watkins' memorandum describing how he was supposedly pressured to fire the entire staff of the White House Travel Office, I have been subjected to false attacks at least as vicious as the ones on which I was tried and acquitted. This time, however, there is no trial. This time, I will not sit silently and take it. The Clinton administration and its spokespersons have truly gone into full attack in an effort to hide the truth. In a series of radio, television, and print interviews, Mrs. Clinton has sought to minimize her involvement in the firing. In interviews with Barbara Walters and again on national public radio, Mrs. Clinton stated that her only involvement was to express concern about the financial mismanagement that was discovered when the president arrived. Since the president arrived in January 1993, one can only assume that she is referring to purported financial mismanagement that was discovered at or about that time. Her lawyer, David Kendall, repeated this claim on Nightline, and Ann Lewis, the deputy director of the Clinton-Gore campaign, did the same on a national public radio talk show. Over two Sundays, Robert Bennett first cl claimed on this week with David Brinkley that I had agreed to plead guilty to embezzlement and followed this up on Face the Nation with the untrue and previously unheard charge that the travel office was involved in scandal which implicated customs laws and state tax laws. I do not know who gave the order that resulted in David Watkins firing me and my six colleagues on May 19, 1993. I can tell you that I met with Ms. Janet Green, Mr. Watkins' former assistant, on May 17, 1993, in the office of Mr. Al Nagy, another member of the White House staff, to discuss what had gone on in the travel office over the previous weekend. After meeting with Ms. Green for about an hour, she said, Billy, I'm going to tell you something, and if you ever repeat it, I will deny it. There is one person and only one person responsible for what has taken place with, with your office, and he occupies the old office. Now, do I need to mention any names? From my point of view, it hardly matters whether Mr. Watkins was acting on his own or at the direction of the President, Mrs. Clinton, Harry Thomason, or anyone else. What does matter is that the public understands that the firings were not driven by supposed concerns over financial mismanagement, but were in fact the product of a decision that was reached long before anyone even began to look into the way that the travel office was managed. What matters to me is that fancy lawyers and others who speak for the White House not be allowed to get away with the lie that my colleagues and I were involved in other kinds of wrongdoing. It also matters to me that people not be allowed to spread the equally vicious lie that I was willing to plead guilty to embezzlement before trial. And, and finally, it matters to me that these same people not be allowed to tell the public that the travel office was cleaned up and is now managed better. During the preparation for my trial, we discovered a lot of information that demonstrated that the so-called financial mismanagement discovered by Pete Marbert between May 14th and May 16th, 1993, merely provided a convenient excuse to carry out a decision that had been in the works for a long time. Legal rules kept the jury from hearing those facts. For example, in September 1992, Travel Weekly magazine published an interview with David Watkins in which he extolled the critical role 
of worldwide travel for its essential role in ensuring that the Clinton campaign had sufficient funds to spend on certain crucial primaries. Worldwide had accomplished this by its creative billing procedures of the media that traveled with the Clinton campaign. This is the same Little Rock travel agency whose employees were already sitting at our desk when we returned for our, from our meeting with David Watkins the day we were fired. Then in November 1992, days after the election, Stephen Davison of Worldwide told Arkansas Business Magazine that Worldwide was already considering opening an office in Washington to handle the travel needs of the president's staff, a function that had always been performed by the travel office. In December 1992, Worldwide raised this issue in, in a letter to Catherine Cornelius, a Clinton campaign and transition staffer and cousin of the president, who passed it on to her superior, David Watkins, along with her endorsement. Later that month came the first of several memoranda written by Ms. Cornelius in which she set forth her plans to restructure the travel office with herself and my job and given worldwide the staff ticketing function. We also learned at about the same time several White House correspondents were told by a Clinton transition official that the new administration had plans to remove the travel office staff. On inauguration day, we began to get calls in the travel office from people looking for the new director, Catherine Cornelius. A few days later, Darnell Martins, Harry Thomason's partner in the charter brokerage business, drafted a memorandum in which he set out his ideas for taking over the other major function of the travel office, arranging for press charters. Like the ticketing function, this was another potentially lucrative area of business for a private firm. I was not aware of this memorandum when Mr. Martins called me a few weeks later to discuss this proposal. When I explained to him, politely I had thought that I couldn't see the benefit of dealing through a middleman to perform the functions that the travel office had performed for decades to the apparent satisfaction of the press and all previous administrations. Mr. Martins followed up with a second memorandum to Mr. Thomason, complaining about me personally. Of course, I was unaware of this memorandum. I was also unaware that several weeks later and several weeks before Pete Marwick ever set foot in the travel office, Mr. Thomason began to spread the rumor that I was demanding kickbacks in exchange for charter business. No one ever confronted me with that rumor, nor to my knowledge did anyone ever try to determine whether there was any truth to it until after I was fired. It was an absolute lie that was spread, so far as I can tell, to begin the process of justifying my removal. I take some satisfaction in the fact that the Justice Department thoroughly investigated this allegation and rejected it. Yet, without even looking into the charge, Mr. Watkins installed Catherine Cornelius into the travel office with the directions to keep her eyes and ears open. When Ms. Cornelius reported to him and Mr. Thomason that she believed that I and other travel office employees were living beyond her conception of what a government employee ought to be able to afford, the White House Counsel was notified and the FBI was contacted. All of this occurred before the administration's decision on May 13th to retain Pete Marwick to perform it perform a financial review of the travel office. In addition, documents I've read about in the papers the last few weeks state that on May 12th, Mrs. Clinton was already expressing her desire to have us replaced. So I'm forced to wonder, what is the financial mismanagement that she was concerned with before Pete Marwick even began its work? It is also important for people to understand that the most serious issue raised by Pete Marwick, which did not issue its final report until two days after we were fired, was my failure to record five checks totaling $14,000 in the office's petty cash log. No one from the administration ever asked for an explanation. Even though I had worked at the travel office for seven previous presidents, had background investigations by the FBI, and maintained an unblemished record, What's even worse, they decided to fire everyone, even though it was clear that I was the only person responsible for these discrepancies. All of these facts lead us to conclude that the financial mismanagement that the White House says is the reason we were fired is just a convenient excuse. If the President or the First Lady or anyone else wanted us out in order to give the business to their friends and supporters, that was their privilege. But why can't they just admit that that is what they wanted to do, rather than con con continue to make up an accusation 
to hide that fact. The administration has also tried to justify its handling of my firing by claiming that I, I had offered to plead guilty to embezzlement, the charge that the jury acquitted me on. That is simply not the case. In late November 1994, after investigating me for 18 months, the Justice Department told my lawyers that it had decided to indict me on two counts of embezzlement. After talking to my family and consulting with our lawyers, we decided to try to put an end to the anguish and avoid the expense of trial, which was estimated upwards of $450,000. By admitting that I should not have put travel office checks into my own account, something I have always admitted at trial. The letter from my lawyer to the Justice Department made clear that I would never admit to having spent the travel office money on myself because I had not done that. It was always important to me that everyone understand that I had not embezzled any money. The Justice Department refused to end the case on that basis, so we went to trial. And the, the jury accepted my explanation. Since the Justice Department's own rules prohibit the release of confidential communications, I don't know how the letter made it into the hands of the press but it angers me beyond words that people are trying to take advantage of this leak to suggest that my acquittal was not deserved. At the end of the trial, the president apologized for what I went through, but I must question the sincerity of that apology in light of the events of the past two weeks. And no one has yet apologized to my colleagues. Instead, the president's lawyers goes on television to level new false charges. And no one tells the public that the new and better travel office doesn't pay its bills on time and has been the subject of constant complaints from the people it is supposed to serve. I will always be grateful to the people who stood up for me at my trial and the many great people around the country who have supported us through these trying times. I always tried to gain the respect and trust of the people I work for in the White House and the people I work with in the press. I look forward to the day this is behind my family and me. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this opportunity, and I, I am prepared to answer all questions to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dale. We appreciate your testimony, and uh, we'll now ask Mr. Brasseau if you would uh, present us with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of this committee, my name is Barney Brasso and I'm a former member of the White House Travel Office. I began my service at the White House in July of 1980. I'm it's sorry. the mic, I'm sorry, and it's the silver mic that picks up your voice. Thank you. Is that better? I'm sorry. I began my service at the White House in July of 1982 and served until May 19, 1993. In my 11 years at the White House, I worked hard and I always tried to do my best. I take a great deal of pride in the job I did and in the tremendous privilege of working at the White House and serving the President of the United States. I'm here today to answer any questions this committee may have regarding my experience in the White House Travel Office and the events surrounding the termination of the Travel Office employees by the Clinton administration on May 19, 1993. For me, the 19th of May 1993 was the beginning of a difficult time and the first of several eventful days that turned my life upside down. I was fired, told to vacate the premises within two hours, driven out of the White House in the back of a cargo van with no seats, implicated by the White House in criminal wrongdoing, and placed under investigation by the United States Justice Department, even though I had no financial responsibility whatsoever in the office. I sometimes find it hard to believe that I'm in the middle of what has become such a publicized event. For the past two and a half years, myself and my colleagues have been the subject of numerous newspaper and magazine articles, radio programs, and television news stories. In the past few weeks, there has been a newspaper story about the travel office firings almost every day. Many questions and concerns have been raised in these reports regarding the handling of our termination, the manner of our dismissal, the damage to our reputations, the impact of this action on our families, the possible involvement of the First Lady of the United States, and the role of the Federal Bureau of Investigation are just a few. All of these issues are very important to me, and I trust to you as well. 
I sincerely hope that my presence here today will prove helpful to you in your continuing efforts to fully explore this entire affair. And I look forward to the final results of this committee's investigation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, sorry for giving you the French pronunciation of your name, so, Mr. Bresso. Um, Mr. McSweeney. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I should start by telling you that I've never made a speech in my life and I ask for your indulgence for my nervousness. As background, my government career began on February 2nd, 1980, when I accepted a position in the White House Travel Office during the administration of President Jimmy Carter. Although I've been a registered Democrat for 44 years, it was not a political but a civil service appointment. This came to an abrupt halt while I was on leave in Ireland when my son Jim called to inform me that the evening news shows had just announced that the entire staff of our office had been fired and that the FBI was starting an investigation for possible criminal activity. For me, our termination did not come as a surprise as for months prior, there were many indications that we were not in their future plans. Worldwide travel from Little Rock in December of 1992, giving interviews to travel trade papers stating that they would be opening an office in Washington to handle White House travel. On their first full day in office, receiving phone calls for Catherine Cornelius, the new head of the White House travel office. And one final indication occurred in the beginning of May when a uniform White House messenger burst into our office and presented each of us with a beautiful long stem red rose along with a note signed by the President and the First Lady, thanking us for all of our hard work during the first 100 days and urging us on to greater accomplishments during the following months. Five minutes later, the same messenger returned and retrieved them with the remark that we should not have received them. <laughs> on my return to the U.S., I was directed and did report to the office of Mr. David Watkins on the morning of May 24 to complete the sign-out formalities required when terminated. I was escorted to the travel office and on entering found Catherine Cornelius, the president's cousin, and now officially the head of the office, who on seeing me departed the office. I was then left with 12 to 15 individuals, none with White House passes, either seated at every desk or going through the travel records located in vertical files within the office. I wish I could say that at that time my concern was for Billy Dale, but it was for myself as I realized that any document or record that I might need to answer any and all charges that might may be brought against me were being gone through by total strangers without anyone with White House clearance being present. As difficult and intimidating as this was, I was more upset to find that when I prepared to pack up my personal effects, I found that they had been thrown out. In fact, the mailbox unit itself, within which we each had storage space, had been dismantled and was sitting in the middle of the office with a sign that said, out. The items lost were trip photos and mementos, personal correspondence, phone and address books, pay stubs, travel vouchers, nothing of great monetary value but my property. What has worried me is that any mail that may have arrived for me during my 10-day leave had also been discarded, and I've never been given an explanation by anyone at the White House for these actions. During the day, I had repeatedly asked that I be given a letter informing me of the reason for my termination and was assured that before I completed my sign-out, one would be provided. Unfortunately, what actually happened was that I was escorted across Pennsylvania Avenue, a public street, as if under arrest by a member of the White House Security Office and taken to the personnel office in the new executive office building where I was presented a prepared letter of resignation that stated that I was resigning due to change in administration. My last act as a White House staff member was to refuse to sign the document presented me, and I was then escorted out of the building. I listened with interest last week when a comparison was made between our dismissal and the handling of the congressional staff members who lost their jobs as a result of the last election. And if one, even one, was handled as we were, they have my sympathy. The following day, May 25th, in spite of all the accusations being put out by the White House during the previous six days, I received a call from Mr. Mark Guerin, an aide to Mr. Mac McClarty, who actually attempted to convince me that I had not really been fired, but had been put on administrative leave, as they now realized that I had no financial authority of any kind within the office. He had no explanation as to why the five of us to which this applied would not be permitted to return to the White House Travel Office. Although the White House recognized that not all of us had any financial authority, 
For the next 30 months, we all became part of a full-blown Department of Justice investigation with Billy Dale as their target. For myself, it involved FBI agents interviewing my neighbors, two grand jury appearances, two Justice Department and FBI interviews, and one meeting with the IRS, along with legal fees over $65,000 of my retirement funds. Over time, where before I've been intimidated, it now turned to complete frustration as the White House had free reign with the media in putting out their story, while we were muzzled by the Justice Department. They presented me with a letter that stated that I was not a subject or target of their investigation at the present time, which meant that anything I said could be used against me. Every day, the White House justifying their actions on the basis of an accounting firm's, quote, audit that found, quote, financial mismanagement, while I'm sitting at home with a copy of the firm's report, which reads, and this is a direct quote from their covering letter, as you know, the procedures were revised throughout our on-site work to reflect the time frame and the limited availability of data, information, and documented policies and procedures. As such, this report may not necessarily disclose all significant matters about the press travel office or reveal errors or irregularities, if any, in the underlying information. Our procedures do not constitute an audit examination or review in accordance with standards established by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and therefore, we do not express an opinion or any other form of assurance on the information presented in our report. To this day, the White House has based the justification for our dismissal on the findings of this report. Billy Dale's trial, which began on October 26th of last year, was preceded two days earlier by the initial hearing of this committee again to have to sit in frustration and hear members of the committee describe our office as a rat's nest of Reagan supporters who stonewalled when one member of the committee attempted to have us make financial disclosure on the cost of presidential travel and we would not. While it is common knowledge that our office has nothing to do with presidential travel and has no allotment or authority to disperse government funds at any time. The allotment and accounting of government funds for non-military presidential travel is made through the administrative office of the White House and for the use of military assets, such as Air Force One and helicopters, through the military office in the White House. Also, the author of an anonymous whistleblower letter was identified by a committee member as a Mr. John Vickroy, a former member of our office who was then supposedly fired when his identity became known to Billy Dale, a clear violation of federal law, when it is common knowledge that John Vickroy retired from the White House and when notified of the committee member's comments, sent a fax to the chairman that same evening, stating his outrage at his name being used, completely denying any involvement with the letter, and supporting Billy Dale's handling of the office. The culmination for me, I had hoped, was when a jury, after less than two hours' deliberation, acquitted Billy Dale of all charges. During this trial, countless members of the press, the very people that he was supposed to be stealing from, came forth and testified on his behalf, while the Justice Department could not produce one, not one, to testify against him. For he and his family, their ordeal should have been over. In fact, the President himself said he was sorry for what Billy had gone through, wished him well, and hoped that he could get on with his life. No one would like that more than Billy Dale, his family, and along with our families, each and every one of us at this table. Unfortunately, as a result of the discovery of a memo from a, a then senior staff member of this administration, which contradicts comments of the First Lady, we again have become targets of false charges. We are now accused, and I believe the wording was, it now seems clear that we allowed press members to circumvent customs regulations on their return to the U.S. from overseas presidential travel. This, in spite of the fact that every international White House press charter has assigned to it on a rotational basis, a U.S. Customs agent who travels with the group and has the responsibility of collecting from each manifested passenger a completed customs declaration and clears all passenger and cargo on board the aircraft. In fact, the same procedure applies to all passengers and cargo on board Air Force One, including the President himself. We were also described as no more than glorified bellmen for the press. I would only quote the President at his press conference of last week when he said, an allegation is not the same thing as a fact, and also that the American people are fundamentally fair-minded. I would hope that he would repeat his statement to some of his spokesmen. 
Along these same lines, during your hearings of last week, a new so what, who cares attitude seemed to be the new theme for some in this room. During a recent First Lady interview, Mrs. Clinton expressed, as would any parent, how concerned she was and the effort she has made to help her daughter cope with hearing the many negative comments being made about her mother. Blanche Dale, unfortunately, was not able to do so for her daughters over the past 30 months. She had to sit and watch as her daughter, Kim, who two days after returning from her honeymoon, had to report to the Department of Justice and show how she had paid for her wedding, her reception, her honeymoon, and since we were present at her reception, answer questions about any discussions we may have had. Her daughter, Vicki, when interviewed by the Justice Department in explaining that she was given her cash car payments to her father so that he could deposit them in the White House Credit Union for her, was asked if she was not uncomfortable with giving her cash to someone who was stealing money from the travel office. To those who say, so what, you should remember that the American people may have a gray area on legalese, but they know right from wrong. On January 1st of this year, I officially retired from government service, having had the privilege of serving four presidents, even if only in a no more than capacity. I would hope that people would understand that for me and thousands of others, when Air Force One would arrive, the markings on the side were not Democratic Party or Republican Party. It read United States of America. The emblem on its side was not a political poster, it was the seal of the executive office of the president. And when that door opened, the man or woman chosen by the people of this country to fill that office had my complete loyalty and support, and I did that for 13 of the proudest years of my life. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. McSweeney, for that uh, eloquent testimony. Now I would like to ask Mr. Wright uh, if you would present your testimony. Mr. Wright. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that's rather a hard act. I'm sorry. That's a hard act to follow, John. I'll read my rather brief statement. My name is Gary D. Wright. I was employed at the White House Telegraph and Travel Office for 32 years before being fired on May 19, 1993, along with the rest of the staff. At the time of my, my dismissal, I was the deputy director of the travel office. I was well aware during my 32 years of serving eight presidents that I worked at the pleasure of the president, which means that I could be terminated at any time without the protection afforded a government employee. However, as one of the White House operating units, our office function was non-political. Our office dates back to at least the Lincoln administration, and no incoming president ever found it necessary to replace our office with their campaign workers. After President Clinton took office, we started getting indications and hearing rumors that we might be replaced by Clinton people and a travel agency. No top-level White House staffers of the Clinton, Clintons ever came to our office to find out what we did, how we did it, or to advise us of any instructions or changes they would want. We worked with the press office during presidential trips as usual, the press office seemed to be happy with our work, so I began to think that we would survive. It came as a complete shock to me on May 19, 1993, to hear on cable news network that I and our entire office had been fired. At the time, I was at work in Seoul, Korea, with the White House advanced survey team preparing for President Clinton's first foreign trip. I was absolutely stunned to hear that Bill Clinton's staff had ordered an FBI investigation of us for criminal wrongdoing. Because of the criminal investigation, I, along with each person in our office, was forced to hire an attorney. As deputy director of the office, I was a prime target, along with the director, Billy Dale, and my financial affairs were investigated in minute detail by the FBI. Due to my position as deputy director, I was not offered another job in the government. I was forced to accept an early involuntary retirement from the government at a reduced annuity. This early retirement has caused financial hardship for me and my family. There have been accusations made about gross financial mismanagement, taking illegal kick, uh, kickbacks and embezzlement. These allegations are all false. I would like to give you a brief history of how we operated our office. Our office originated as the White House Telegraph Office. As telegraph operators for the president, someone from our office traveled on the train with the president when he traveled. 
The office was given the task of coordinating all arrangements with the railroad for the president, staff, and press. As travel progressed from trains to airplanes, our duties and responsibilities changed. When the president started using military aircraft, our office worked with commercial airlines to charter planes for the press. Our primary job was to coordinate the air charters, bus charters, rental cars, baggage trucks, hotel accommodations for the press and press office staff. In addition to being in charge of the press charter, keeping track of the manifest and seeing that things ran smoothly, we also sent a man out in advance of the trip to each overnight stop. After each trip, a memorandum was prepared for each member of the press, advising them of their prorated share of the cost of that trip. Building and bookkeeping, an important and necessary function, was just one part of our job. While our accounting procedures may not have been perfect in the eyes of a professional accounting firm, we did keep complete records of financial transactions. We had spreadsheets that detailed what each member of the press's involvement in each trip and what they were being billed as their prorated share of the trip. The check payment for their travel was logged and posted in the spreadsheet. Every invoice was logged in and a record made of the date and check number when it was paid. In order to get the bills to the press out on a timely basis, usually one or two days after a trip, we had to use estimates for some of our expenses because frequently the vendor's bills would not arrive for several weeks. Because of this, we would sometimes overbill and at other times underbill. Since the same news organizations went on most of the trips, it all evened out over time. As a result of mailing our bills in a timely manner after a trip, we were able to receive payment and pay all of the vendors in 30 days most of the time. At no time did we ask for or accept kickbacks from any air carrier or other vendor with whom we did business. At Mr. Dale's direction, our primary goal was to keep trip costs down. When it came to trip costs, we were the best friends the press corps had. I guess that may have been one of the reasons the Clintons, for the Clintons to fire us. We were a small group of honest, hardworking, dedicated government employees who were trying to do our job the very best we knew how. We all have letters of accommodation from the presidents we have served, as well as from their press secretaries. I'm still trying to come to grips with how our office, so highly thought of and trusted by the people for whom we worked and with whom we did business for so many years, could be perceived by the Clinton White House as being so rotten that the only way they felt they could deal with us was to fire us and engage the FBI to investigate the phony allegations made against us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, now we'll ask Mr. Dreilinger if you would uh, present us with your testimony. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is my name is uh, John P. Drellinger. I uh, am one of the fired members of the uh, White House Travel Office. I was employed at the White House Travel Office from February 1922, 1967, to May 19, 1993. While I was an enlisted man in the Army from December 1961 to February 1967, I had been assigned to duty at the White House Communications Agency. On my release from active duty, I was offered and accepted a job as an assistant in the White House Travel Office. I served in the Travel Office during the administrations of Presidents Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. Counting both my military and civilian service, I have been a government servant for almost 35 years. My duties as an assistant in the travel office were to serve the needs of the White House by assisting the press corps that wished to travel with the president on trips outside of Washington, D.C., and when in Washington, to provide commercial travel services for the White House staff. My duties including acting as an advance representative for presidential trips. This required me to travel to the locations that the president would be visiting and while there make arrangements for hotel space, telephone service, local transportation, meal <clears throat> excuse me, meal catering that would be needed by the members of the press corps and White House staff traveling aboard the press charter. I also traveled on the press charter and coordinated the transportation needs of the press corps and staff during those trips. <clears throat> during my 26 years at the travel office, I believe that I did a good job, both for the White House and for the press corps. I don't know of anything I did that would justify the accusations of financial mismanagement that were made against me in 1993. To the extent that I dealt with the financial end of the travel office, the preparation of bills to the press, the processing of incoming and outgoing checks, and the handling of the petty cash that I would need to take on trips, 
I don't think that I mismanaged anything. To this date, no one has indicated, either orally or in writing, the specifics of what it was that I was accused of doing wrong. In carrying out my duties at the travel office, I dealt with the White House staff, <clears throat> the Secret Service, the Department of State, the military, domestic and foreign airlines, bus and rental car companies, hotel and convention centers, and representatives of many foreign governments. I believe that during my years at the travel office, that the office enjoyed a reputation for honesty, integrity, and competence. I enjoyed my position in the travel office. My duties required that I travel to different parts of the United States <clears throat> and to many foreign countries in the service of the President and the press corps. It was a satisfying job, even though it often required long hours and hard work. I was stunned when I was told by David Watkins on May 19, 1993, that I was being terminated on two hours' notice. And I was angered when I learned that I was being accused of criminal misconduct by the White House. <clears throat> there never was a basis for those allegations, and I think it was irresponsible of the people who made them. I regret that we were not treated as individuals and that the implication of criminal activity was used across the board and tarnished everyone. After the White House in July 1993 acknowledged its mistake in terminating me and most of the others from our travel office positions, I thought that I may be restored to that position and continue in the job. <clears throat> but during the months that the White House was looking for a position for me within government, it was made absolutely clear to me that I would not be returned to the travel office. There never was an explanation why. Eventually, I was forced to accept a position at another government agency <clears throat> where I'm still employed. It is not the position that I wanted, but I was told that if I did not accept it, I would be terminated from government service. I could not afford to have that happen. I understand today from reading the accounts of the events that preceded my firing in May 1993 that the administration wanted to put their people <clears throat> into the travel office, that they didn't seem to understand about the seven of us that staffed the White House travel office under the administrations of as many as eight presidents as that we were their people. I myself <clears throat> had the honor and the privilege to serve six other presidents, and I would have continued to serve President Clinton had I been given the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Drylinger. Uh, and now, Mr. Van Imeren, please. Good morning. My name is Bob Van Imeren. I worked in the White House Travel Office from May 19, 1984 until our sudden dismissal on May 19, 1993. My primary duty was handling reservations and ticketing for commercial air and rail travel for the White House staff and those agencies that are part of the Executive Office of the President. I also traveled to a limited extent in advance and with the White House Press Corps and Press Office staff in conjunction with the trip of the President. This involved in brief making arrangements necessary to assure a smooth and successful trip on their behalf. On May 19, 1993, myself and my former co-workers were terminated under the guise of financial mismanagement. Speaking for myself, I had no involvement in the finances under question in review of the travel office, yet I was terminated nonetheless. To add insult to injury, <clears throat> excuse me, I found my reputation dragged through the mud when the White House press secretary announced to the world that the FBI was called to investigate possible criminal conduct in the office. At that point, I had to seek counsel of an attorney to defend myself from this baseless charge. I understood that I served at the pleasure of the president, but I did not have to accept false accusations. I was placed on paid administrative leave after it was determined that I had no connection to the charges being levied. After five months of negotiations with the White House, a position uh, with another government agency was offered to me, which I accepted. And for that, I'm grateful. But almost three years later, questions regarding the operation of the travel office under Billy Dale remain. And I welcome this opportunity to respond to your questions pertaining to my role and tenure in the White House travel office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Imeren. Mr. Mom, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Ralph T. Mo Mon. Was born and raised in Northport, Alabama. Attended at Northport Elementary School, Tuscaloosa County High School. Okay. Like some of the others, I'm not used to this. In March 1949, I joined the Alabama National Guard's 31st Division. And uh, was placed on active duty in, with the Army in Jan January 16, 1951. While on active duty, I served at Anahuitac Atoll in the Marshall Islands, which was a Pacific Atomic Proving Ground for the United States. 
I served until August of 1952, was released from active duty, returned to Northport, where I finished high school and worked in the Shell plant until August of 1953, at which time I enlisted in the United States Air Force and spent the next 19 years on active duty. My primary job in the Air Force was cryptographic operations. During my career in the United States Air Force, I had numerous assignments throughout the world. And one of these assignments was at Shepard Air Force Base, Texas. And while at Shepard, I worked as a cryptographic operations instructor. This assignment, during this assignment, I was one of 20 instructors interviewed for duty with the White House and the White House Communications Agency. Of the 20 interviewed, three were selected for duty. During my five years at the White House, during the Johnson administration and the first Nixon administration, I worked as a communication center specialist. At the end of my five-year tour, I spent a year in Vietnam. Upon returning to the States, I was assigned to the Defense Communications Agency with a duty station in JCS, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Communication Center to Pentagon. I worked there until I suffered a heart attack in November 1971. I was hospitalized two months, then returned to light duty until I was placed on TDRL, a temporary disabled retired list, in June of 1972. I remained on TDRL until December 25th, 1973, when I was placed on permanent disabled retired list because of my inability to pass a physical for worldwide duty. I worked two civilian jobs after that, one as a service station attendant and the other as a management tra trainee for a consumer finance company after I was medically retired. I returned to the White House as a civil service employee in September of 1973 and worked in the Telegraph and Transportation Office as a communications officer and a travel assistant as required. I was employed as a civilian in the White House for a period of 19 years and nine months during the F Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush administration and the first four months of the Clinton administration at which time I was fired along with six other employees in the Telegraph and Travel Office, supposedly for financial mismanagement and sloppy bookkeeping. While employed in the Telegraph Travel Office, I was responsible for the record, which is printed communications, all unclassified, both sent and received by the President, Vice President, and staff members with the Executive Office of the President and the White House Office of Administration. This duty included preparing and transmitting large books or batches of mailgram, mailgram invitations to social events as directed by the social office. I also made bank deposits to the White House Press Travel Fund bank account at the Riggs National Bank, located on Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest Washington, D.C. This entailed taking the checks that were received from the press participants of a trip in support of the president, running a tape on them, verifying the tape to be correct, usually with another member of the office staff, but not always, due to personnel being out of the office on trips supporting the president. This verified tape was in Xerox, with a proper check number and organization from which it came would be typed next to the amount of the check. This provided us with a three-column record for future reference if the need ever arose to verify any check or billing misunderstanding. On May 19, 1993, the complete office staff of the Telegraph and Travel Office were summarily fired. This action caused an un untold amount of stress on the seven employees and their families. During this time of the firing and the time that uh, Mr. Billy R. Dale was cleared in a jury trial, three of our fathers passed away prior to the trial and were buried, never knowing for sure that their sons were not guilty of what they had been approved of, uh, excuse me, accused of. Five of the employees, two uh, which were not even in the country at that time, were placed on administrative leave with pay for the remainder of May, at which time we were told we would be removed from the payroll but would continue to have medical and hospitalization insurance for an additional 30 days. Prior to the end of the May, we, the five, were called by Mr. <coughs> Mark Gearing, Deputy Chief of Staff, and told that we would be on administrative leave with pay for an indefinite period of time. After, five, uh, after a five-month period of administrative leave, we were offered jobs with the federal government at different locations. Two were employed with the General Services Administration, one by the State Department, one by the Commerce Department, and I went to the Defense Department. 
in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Policy Support, and Emergency Planning, where I remain until I retire from federal government on January 2, 1996, with a combined total of 42 years and eight months of service to the United States of America, of which I am very proud. I sincerely thank you for giving me this opportunity to enter this statement into the record. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mom, and thank uh, all of our panel for your very, uh, very compelling stories of uh, the events surrounding uh, your firing and uh, uh, the events subsequent to your firing and what it has meant to you during your lives. We'll now start with the uh, five-minute rule, and I will uh, start with the first, uh, first round of questioning. Uh, Mr. Dale, just to be very clear, there, you did not handle taxpayers' money. I mean, there was no federal money involved in, in the uh, accounts that were under your uh, supervision, were there? That's true. One of the things that struck me about this whole exercise for the past two and a half years that we've been sort of looking at this or attempting to look at it has been the uh, very strong support that you and the others have received really across the board, and many of those coming from the news media, uh, who are the ones that are presumably the ones that uh, were affected if there was in fact uh, wrongdoing with regard to their money. Uh, people like uh, Britt Hume and Sam Donaldson and others uh, really testified on your behalf. Were there any members of the news media that, uh, whose, whose uh, funds you were a steward of uh, who testified in your trial against you or raised concerns about uh, your mismanagement, supposedly, of the travel office funds? No, sir. Uh, all, in fact, all of the witnesses that appeared uh, from the news media were uh, character witnesses on your behalf, were they not? That's true, and we had more standing in the wings waiting to testify, wanted to testify, and the judge said, I've heard enough, let's call a halt to this. Even though you were really being accused of stealing from the news media. I mean, That's that, correct. These were their funds, uh, not taxpayer funds. These were their funds, which you were being charged with uh, ripping off, uh, basically. Let me just get right to the couple of critical charges that were made, just to clarify them. Uh, the charge that... that, uh, that you had a large, it was sort of a large slush fund of money. You carried large amounts of cash, which were unaccounted for, one. And the second charge is that you did put money into your own account. And that you've, you've testified the reason for that was, uh, the reason you in, in negotiated a plea was because that was going to be difficult to, to really get across to a jury. Can you tell us, in your own words, why, that, why you used that technique? Yes, sir. In 1982, when I took over the, as director of the travel office, I had a meeting with the White House Correspondents Association and some other White House staff members to discuss how we could hold down the cost of future trips. In that meeting, it was decided that I should maintain a surplus of $25,000 in the account. And if that account grew to, let's say, $30,000 because of some windfall or something, then the next trip, I would work that $5,000 off by decreasing the trip expenses by one, two, three, five percent. Also, if that fund dropped to $20,000, I could make it up on future trips or the next trip by the, using the same manner of accounting. Well. $25,000 in 1982 was probably enough money, but by 1988, it had become apparent to me that $25,000 was not enough money to maintain this surplus of. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about, is in 1986, UPI went bankrupt and stuck me with approximately $40,000. That was $40,000 that I had to make up on future trips. And it wasn't easy. And there were other things that happened along the way, unexpected charges that came up. For one time I, in Madrid, Spain, I had to pay $29,000 for unused hotel rooms on behalf of the press corps. So the checks, by and large, that I put through my personal checking account were refund checks from telephone companies that had overbilled us for one reason or another and sent the money back. Now, if I had put those in the Riggs account, it was my obligation to work that off on the next trip. Well, it was apparent to me that the next trip was not 
necessarily the one that I wanted to work it off on. It may not be the one that needed to work it off on. So I cashed those checks. I kept the money in the travel office behind my desk, and I used it as I saw fit on future trips for unexpected expenses like that that I did not intend to bill back to the press. And none of that money was used for your own uh, benefit in any way? And no, sir. That money was always in the travel office. And you did uh, keep a record of the amounts that were, uh, were put through that account, um, but I'm, my understanding is that those records uh, have not been able to be located. That's right. I kept the same ledger sheets for that fund that I kept for the petty cash fund. In February of 1993, the loose leaf binder that we had kept the petty cash logs in had never been emptied. And I decided to take all the ledger sheets out of the petty cash log except for one year's worth. And I put all of these together in a large manila envelope. It was my intention to separate those by years and then file them in a file cabinet that corresponded to that year. But I got busy later that afternoon. I got a telephone call or something, and I just put the envelope behind my desk in a window well in a file rack and thought I'll get to it later. I never got to it later because that envelope disappeared after Catherine Cornelius came to work in the office. Let me just ask all of you one simple question. I think it requires a yes or no. My time's about to expire. One of the accusations was, and there was a whistleblower letter at one point that suggested that you all were uh, sort of uh, aiders and abettors of smuggling operations in terms of bringing in uh, valuable uh, oriental rugs and fine wines and so forth. Uh, let me just ask each of you, if, if you would, to say yes or no. Did you facilitate or aid or abet smuggling of this kind in any way, Mr. Mom? No, sir. Mr. Bayon? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, no, sir. Mr. Wright, Mr. Van Eimer. No, sir. Uh, well, I think I just wanted to get that laid to rest right off the bat so that we don't have to deal with that. My time has expired. I now recognize. Uh, could, could, uh, on your line of questioning, could I ask for a clarification? I believe you asked uh, whether uh, you asked a question concerning the people who testified at the trial and indicated that they were willing to testify despite the fact that the funds involved were their funds. Is it not true that the funds involved would have been the funds of their employer and not their personal funds? That is, that is correct, but I believe he also indicated that nobody from the news media, either the employers or the employees, uh, testified or were, uh, were involved in his trial at all. So I, I think. Uh, to clarify that, that right. Sam Donaldson, if he was testifying, it was not about his personal funds that he had any reason to be concerned because he would have been reimbursed in any he case did. by ABC. He did indeed, but he also indicated that he felt that Mr. Dale was a totally honest man and never had any cause to question his integrity. The gentlelady from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I understand that um, several of you have already retired. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. I understand that several of you, uh, well, two or three of you have already retired, but at the time that this happened, uh, did any of you lose any pay? Any of you? No, I was paid but called a thief. And everybody else was paid, is that right? Yeah. All, of, all of you were paid. Okay, thank you very much. Now, in your new job, were you given civil service protections? All of you were given civil service protections, and that included uh, seniority rights and due pro uh, more important than that, due process rights. Is that so? That's the case. Mr. McSweeney, I believe it was that you testified that um, um, uh, on page five of your testimony that you had legal fees of over $65,000 of your retirement funds? $65,000 of my money, which I plan to use for my retirement. My retirement funds are in the government. Okay, did you... But I, they're my funds. Were you aware of the fact that the GAO said that you were entitled to have those uh, legal funds reimbursed? GAO has what? I'm sorry? That the GAO, GAO has said that you are entitled to have those funds reimbursed. Those funds, the funds that were within the government for my retirement is a completely separate amount of money from the $65,000 that came out of my pocket, not the government retirement.
I think what, uh, what I might clarify is that the use of the term pension funds is that I wanted to use that money for my pension okay. when I retired. I'm looking at the GAO report. And it's on page 49, in case you want to review it or have some one uh, legal person review it. It says that Title I of the Act, which appropriates money to the Department of Transportation, provided $150,000 to the DOT Office of General Counsel for the Travel Office investigation related legal expenses of the five employees during calendar year 1993 on the condition that the employees were not subjects of the investigation. And as of April 14th, no funds had been paid yet to reimburse the employees' legal expenses. So. Uh, somewhere along in there, I believe that you can be reimbursed. Uh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, in fact, we have been reimbursed for that 150,000, but that is not, it uh, doesn't cover what we all it spent. Doesn't cover it all. Uh, okay, all right then, Mr. Dale, uh, you have answered some of these questions, and I want to uh, just ask you a few more. You know all these findings of Pete Mark, the lack of accountability, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, do you disagree with these findings? Absolutely. That answers that question very, very quickly. <laughs> now, what about the lack of accounting uh, controls and systems and policies and no system of procurement documents and no general ledger and all that? Do you agree with those findings? I do not, and I don't know if those are, um, if they mean me or the White House or who they are, who are they referring to in that report that you're reading from. I had records to prove every financial transaction that took place in that travel office as long as I was the director until Catherine Cornelius came into the office. And after she came in, I couldn't, I can't tell you what happened. And I can tell you that on October the 24th, I sat at home and I watched this hearing. And if the jury had been sitting in this room, I was a convicted felon by the people, on the, some of the people on this panel. And I just, I got so angry that I just, I didn't know what people on the, some of the people on this panel. And I just, I got so angry that I just, I didn't know what to do. And then you said to yourself later, thank God for juries. Because thank God jury that that jury not... wasn't sitting in this room that day. No, that's true, but ultimately it happened. But you people convicted me before I ever went to trial. I, I went back and I watched the tape of it yesterday, and it just irritated me even deeper than it did then. Well, let me say this. Uh, if, in fact, you were convicted, as you say, by this panel, I believe it was in an effort to find out actually what had happened. And if you felt that you were offended in some way, know, too, that that's part of our responsibility is to try to get at the truth of whatever the matter was. And we hope that you do not now feel that we created a great injustice to you, and especially in light of the fact that the jury found that that was not the case. Um, uh, I'll reserve my feelings. Well, fine. That's fair enough. Now, you've taken issue with the White House's allegation of financial mismanagement and shoddy accounting. And on um, May, 20, uh, May 14th, Pete, I'm, I keep on doing this, Pete Marvel, because I want to give you a chance to clear it up. On May 14, 1993, the Pete Marwick reviewers discovered discrepancies in the recording of accounts in the petty cash fund. We talked about that. And the following day, you told Daniel Russell, one of those CPAs, that you had located some of the missing funds. Now, I'm going to quote from the FBI's interview notes to you. And you said that you told Mr. Russell that you had to set aside money to use as kickback money to, remove, to move luggage. Dale, he says, did not supply the money earlier because he knew it did not look good and it reflected that he had done a poor job of accounting. Now, tell me in your own words what happened there. First of all, when Mr. Russell came in the office on the morning of May the 14th, nobody ever told me that this was an audit. This was a review of the travel office to see if services could be streamlined or improved in any way. Nobody ever told me to provide any money to Mr. Russell. And I dispute the fact that he said that I gave him the money the next day. I remember as, as showing it to him that afternoon when it became apparent to me that this was more than just a review because of the records that he was asking for. So there's in some in, inconsistencies in what he remembers and what I remember.
<laughs> the uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Minutes. You know, I've heard this White House talk about their concern for federal employees over the past several weeks and months. But the way you guys were treated is beyond comprehension. It rivals, in my opinion, the Spanish Inquisition. This is just unbelievable. The jury was out less than two hours, less than two hours, and they came back with a not guilty verdict on Mr. Dale, and yet my Democrat colleagues appear today to continue to question the veracity of that decision. I mean, I don't know why you're even talking about that. He's been acquitted, not guilty, no problem. Now, these people, Mr. McSweeney and Mr. Dale, both voted for Bill Clinton. They're Democrats. So this cuts across party lines. They were there. No, I won't yield. Well, you use my I will name. not yield. I will not yield. Mr. Chairman. Although I will not yield. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman, gentleman from Indiana controls the time, and well, he has Mr. indicated I will he will not, not yield. yield. I did use my name and call me Democrat cause, and I think the Republican I will not yield. I did not use your name. I will not yield. Me to explain I, my I, I do not believe that the gentleman used Point of name. information. Mr. Chairman, Gen and General clarification. Will state, state her point of information. Point of information and clarification. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the speaker, Mr. Burton, said that uh, the Democrats called this hearing. We did not call this hearing, Mr. Say Chairman. That. This was I, not our idea. I didn't Would say you that. please clarify lady, who called this hearing? The uh, gentlelady should understand that the chairman called the hearing. I don't believe Mr. Burton implied or suggested or stated that uh, the minority had called this hearing. It was called at my request. Uh, because I felt it was time, past due time, for these gentlemen to have a chance to tell their story under oath in a public forum. The gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I hope they didn't take away from my time because okay. I want my full okay. five minutes. Now, one of the things that concerns me, and first of all, I want to apologize to you guys for what you've been through, for what your kids have been through and what your wives have been through and what your family has been through. I think you've done a great job, and I've talked to a lot of members of the media and you have the highest respect from the people in the media, people who attack Republicans as well as Democrats. They think you did a great job down there. And I think that's one of the reasons they took the approach they did at the White House to try to get rid of you, because they didn't want to offend the media and cause a black eye for themselves. Now, let me just talk about a few things. The First Lady has said time and again she had no involvement in this. Now, we go back to Mr. Watkins. He says, we both knew there would be hell to pay if after our failure in the Secret Service situation earlier, we failed to take swift and decisive action in conformity with the First Lady's wishes. Now, there's some question about, she says time and again she had nothing to do, but today we find a note to Mac McClarty from Ricky Seidman, the White House senior advisor to Mac McClarty, on July the 9th, and she says in that memo, heads up, possible New York Times negative editorial regarding Hillary and the travel office. Maggie and Podesta trying to stop it. She's uh, st stall stalling, uh, she's talking to uh, Janine regarding scheduling. Webb Hubble uh, must meet with you. And then there's another note here, it says, heads up, New York Times negative editorial regarding H Hillary and the travel office. Webb Hubble needs 30 minutes with the first lady. It seems to me unbelievable that all of these people at the White House are either lying or incorrect in the First Lady's involvement. Now, I'm not concerned about the administration's ability to fire these individuals should they have chosen to do so. That doesn't bother me because new administrations come in and they can replace anybody they choose. But when they start doing things like they did, destroying people's reputations, and misusing the power of the White House, that goes way beyond the scope of just getting rid of people they want, don't want in there and putting people in who are their friends. Now, I have been led to believe, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, we're able to bring Mrs. Uh, Kennedy, the head of the IRS, in here, Ms. Richardson, the head of the IRS, in here, because we have notes which lead us to believe that the IRS uh, may have been involved in trying to keep a lid on this. I'm trying to find my notes here real quickly. Yeah, here we are. According to the White House staff notes of an interview with Beth Nolan and Cliff Sloan of the White House Counsel's Office, BK, that's Bill Kennedy, in the White House Counsel's Office said that PR, that's Peggy Richardson, the commissioner for the IRS, is on top of it. She said at a party the IRS is on top of it. 
and some reference to IRS agents aware or something like that. Now, if the White House went so far as to use the IRS and the FBI to try to discredit these people and to force them out, that is a miscarriage of justice, and I believe it borders on a felony. And we need to get to the bottom of that, Mr. Chairman, and bring those people before this committee, have them put under oath so that we can find out if those kinds of wrongdoings took place. And there may be some prosecutions in order down the road. I have a number of questions here I'd like to ask uh, the gentleman real quickly. I know my time's probably going to run out. Do you believe, gentlemen, any of you, that uh, the IRS may be prepared to audit you, or have you had any indications you might be audited by the IRS? Mr. Burton, first of all, let me correct the record. I am not a Democrat. <laughs> well, I did, the only reason I said that, Mr. Dale, is because in November 1992, yeah. in an article, it says, like a lot of fellow Marylanders, Billy Dale went into the polling booth and cast his vote for Bill Clinton. I was like a lot of people, he says, I thought we needed a change, so maybe you just made one mistake. Uh, no. <laughs> I am Can registered at... Too? I did not vote for Bill Clinton. My lawyer said I did because I was a registered Democrat, but no, I did not. Well, But on your question, yes, I am the target of an IRS audit at this time. Do you feel that uh, this is an uh, unjustifiable action? Well, I, I feel like that it was... Uh, brought on by the travel office firings, yes. Are you familiar with Ultra Air down in Tennessee? Yes, sir, I am. Did uh, you have any, uh, uh, have you talked to any of those people down there in the last few months or last? Yes, sir, I have. Uh, they asked for an opinion from the IRS about excise taxes, and within 24 hours, they were literally attacked by the IRS agents who took all of their records and for the next 24 months had them under a very, uh, uh, scrupulous investigation and they were found to not have done anything wrong That's and it right. leads one to believe that the IRS was used to try to discredit you through Alter Air and also discredit Alter Air. Do you believe that's the case? Yes sir I do. So you think that there's a real possibility that the IRS and Mrs. Richardson may have been involved with the White House in trying to uh, put you fellows uh, in a bad light? Well I can tell you that uh, I don't remember the date but somewhere along October November of 1993 I got a summons from the IRS to appear in my attorney's office and bring all documents pertaining to the travel office. I went, and it was our understanding that they were going to question me about the excise tax and how the White House Travel Office had handled it. And as the meeting was drawing to a close, uh, the, they had asked me a lot of personal questions, what kind of automobile did I drive, and things like that. And they looked at me and they said, don't be surprised if you hear from Baltimore and they want to audit you. Now, as I understand it, the rest of you ha have had indications that the IRS may be wanting to uh, audit you or, or talk to you as well. That's correct. Is that correct? That's uh, correct. I'm not aware of that in my you, case. You two aren't? No, Any no. of the rest of you? No. no. At, the meeting, uh, at the meeting between my counsel and the IRS, they said, basically the same thing, you know, not to be surprised if it happened. Well, Mr. Chairman, I know my time's up, but just let me make one request, and that is that we do have Ms. Richardson appear before this committee under oath, and I hope we can bring Mr. Hubble in as well because I have a number of questions for as, him. Uh, as I've indicated to you, uh, we intend to do that, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at this time, I'm pleased to recognize the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, once again, this uh, committee is playing politics instead of shaping policy. More taxpayer dollars are being spent on allegations that even if revealed to be true, wouldn't even be illegal. If the majority is so concerned about the White House Travel Office, it should be focusing this hearing on how to improve management in the White House Travel Office. That would be a uh, very constructive conversation. So at the risk of uh, sounding uh, constructive in what I consider just one more shot in the opening of the 1996 presidential campaign, I would like to ask my colleagues to join me in a bill that would privatize the travel office, that would just depoliticize it, professionally manage it, the Republicans aren't happy with how the, the way the Democrats ran it. The Democrats aren't happy with the way that the Republicans ran it. 
I suggest that we move forward, privatize the office, and get on with the other problems before government. But I would like to ask the panelists a, a question. I'd like to ask each and every one of you the same question. And I'd like to begin with uh, Mr. McSweeney. I'd like to ask you if you personally knew of any activity relating to White House travel <coughs> office operations and occurring during your service in that office that was illegal. And if you knew of any activity that was illegal, will you please elaborate and tell us about it? No, I did not. Do not know of any that was illegal. I mean, like, do you have a specific? No, I'm asking you. No, ma'am, I do not. Did you? I would sir? not have done it. I, I know you wouldn't. Y yes, sir, would you? No, did I am not aware of any illegal activities. Did you? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma Mr. Dale, would you describe the duties of the travel office? I was. Um, uh, curious about one of your statements earlier where you said that in travel over to Spain you had to pay for the cost of the hotel rooms for that the press corps. <laughs> why did you have to pay for the, their hotel room? Why, why didn't they pay for their own hotel room? Because these were hotel rooms that we had reserved on their behalf and went unused. And you always, and if they're not unused then your office would pick up the cost of that? That's, as that's opposed true, to billing? but I, unfortunately we never had to pick up a a tab that large before. Could you just outline what your office did? Well, our office made the travel arrangements for the White House Press Corps to cover the president, which included the chartering of an airplane, handling their luggage, equipment, chartering buses, trucks, rental vehicles to meet them on the distant end, reserving hotel rooms, booking them, coordinating with the bellman, and just any logistical arrangement that needed to be made on their behalf, which included handling their passports on international trips, turning them over to an uh, immigrations officer that traveled along with the customs officer, and just making sure that everything ran smooth, and I thought we did a good job at it. Uh, are you aware that last September an interagency group issued a report recommending full agency use of travel management centers, in other words, privatizing uh, <coughs> uh, all travel throughout government? Did you see that report? No, ma'am, I did not. And uh, you mentioned that you handled reservations and, and ticketing service for the White House. And are you aware that they are now being performed by a private travel management agency? Yes, ma'am. Um, and which is really, as I understand it, how it's handled throughout government. And uh, in a 1994 GAO report, a request for proposal for executive office travel services was issued in 1994 of April, and that also offered the possibility of additional work to include arranging air charter services with fees to be negotiated. Um, I would appreciate your, your comments on the outsourcing or privatizing of the air chartered operation for the executive office. Do you see any reason why that service cannot be uh, privatized? Personally, yes, I do. Could you tell us because why? Because of the security that's involved in presidential trips. If you're talking about the White House press charters, that's the only one that I'm familiar with and that's the only one that I feel qualified to talk about. But if you're suggesting that a private company could arrange those charters, uh, well, it just, I think that you need to find out more about what the travel office did and the security involved in a presidential trip. In presidential trips now, uh, staff travel in the White House currently is done by a private contractor. If it's done for the staff by a private contractor, why can't uh, the press activity also be done by a private contractor? understanding that it is not. Now, are you talking about the commercial travel or the charters? Both. It's my understanding that it's a private company does the commercial travel, but White House employees handle the White House press charters. That's my understanding, and, and you can understand why that I haven't been back since the day after I was fired. Well, can you um, elaborate on why your job could not be done by a private company? Well, I didn't say it couldn't be done, but it, I just don't, I don't think it, it is realistic to think that a private company can come on and the Secret Service would communicate with them 
on security arrangements and the coordination of the movement of Air Force One with a private company and the turnover that they might have as they would with government White House employees. Yes, uh, that is the way it's handled in many cases. That's the way it's handled with the staff. Not for the President of the United States. When you're, when you're talking staff, are you talking to the staff that, that's on Air Force One? The staff on Air Force One is on Air Force One. Yeah, the, but I'm talking on the about additional staff that may go that is not on Air Force One. If the staff is on Air Force One, they're with the president. The, so the only staff that would be going on the press plane would be the press office staff, okay? And their arrangements are made through White House personnel working in the White House travel office, unless that has changed in the last month and a half. Well, I was very, if I, if I could have an additional minute, very touched by your, your statement, Mr. McSweeney, when you said you looked at Air Force One and there was the emblem and it wasn't a Republican emblem, it Correct. wasn't a Democrat, it was the United States of America. And, and I, I don't see why uh, we can't treat the travel office the same way. Let's not have a Republican one or a Democratic one. Let's have a professional office. We never have. We, we never have. We never have. And, and, uh, and uh, I'd like to discuss this further with you. I don't see why this cannot be handled <laughs> if it's a separate plane, separate from the president. Uh, by a private company. General Lay's time has so, expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and in response to the question about wasn't, shouldn't one of our concerns be how we could improve uh, the travel office, and I think that is obviously one of our purposes here, as well as how we could improve travel in the Department of Commerce, travel in the Department of Energy, uh, where there seem to have been uh, serious problems that have not yet come before this committee, but perhaps shall. This time I would like to recognize the gentlelady from the Maryland. state of Maryland. I, the time is uh, Mrs. Morello. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to uh, commend you, Chairman Klinger, for holding this important hearing to further investigate the injustice that was done to uh, our, several, our seven federal civil servants. And I really want to thank our witnesses for their years of loyal government service and for appearing before us today. We know it's not easy to relive this over and over again. The effects that the firings have had on your lives and the lives of your families is really inexcusable, and I find it to be shocking. All White House employees, whether they're part of the uh, civil service or political appointment process, serve at the pleasure of the president. The president can restructure the White House according to perceived needs or the plans of the administration, and no one has questioned that. Indeed, Mr. Dale, you indicated that you and your colleagues anticipated there might be changes in the travel office. But to fire seven loyal civil servants under the pretenses of criminal conduct without real evidence before a report was even complete is absolutely outrageous. I'm particularly glad that we're holding a hearing to focus on the impact of these political actions on the lives of uh, those of you who are involved, something that politics have overshadowed so far. The travel office staff members we're career government employees, and we have heard from between 9 and 32 years experience in the travel office itself, including service to both Democratic and Republican presidents. They reported to work one day, were told that they were fired as a result of their poor performance and mismanagement. Further, a White House spokesperson told the media that their termination was also due in part to findings of an FBI investigation including potential criminal conduct. They were told to clear out their belongings after up to 32 years of service were escorted from the White House grounds in a cargo van by the, the Secret Service. What a reward that is for loyal service. They returned home to friends and family who had learned on television that they were fired in conjunction with an FBI investigation. You know, Mr. Chairman, it's precisely these human effects that warrant these hearings. Federal employees, regardless of where they work at the Justice Department, Defense, White House, should not be fired on the basis of false allegations. What is so painfully apparent in this case is that false charges were brought against dedicated long-term federal employees to justify their firings. I serve on the Civil Service Subcommittee. I represent a lot of federal employees. I think this is absolutely outrageous. I wanted to point out, Mr. Dale, uh, the investigation um, of you even involved the investigation of the costs of your daughter's wedding. 
I have never heard of anything like that. Mr. Brazo, you were in a cargo van, you mentioned, with no seats. Uh, you asked to, to uh, um, vacate in two hours and that an investigation was to take place. Mr. McSweeney, you were called by your son in Ireland and told that this was the case. Mr. Wright, you were in Korea and you had to hire an attorney. Mr. Drelinger, 26 years in the travel office with seven presidents. Mr. Van Imeren, no involvement in finances in the work you did in the travel office. You needed an attorney. What a plight to be in. Mr. Mon, you've served 42 years in for the United States uh, of America. And as was mentioned, Americans do know right from wrong. Now, there are many questions I could ask, but I wanted to quote from uh, Mr. McSweeney's uh, statement because he quoted a report that we hear a lot of um, that came from um, uh, the Pete Marwick management team that they put together kind of at the last minute, not the auditing team. And in that report, uh, he says that, as you know, the procedures were revised throughout our on-site work to reflect the time frame and the limited availability of data, information, and documented policies and procedures. As such, this report may not necessarily disclose all significant matters about the press travel office or reveal errors or irregularities under the uh, underlying information, if any, in the underlying information. Our procedures do not constitute an audit, examination, or review in accordance with standards established by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. We do not express an opinion or any other form of assurance on the information presented um, in this report. As a matter of fact, they had stated at a subsequent time that what they um, looked at did not warrant firings. I point that out, and, and if I have any time left, referring to what Mr. Dale had said about management now in the travel office, would you, Mr. Dale, in my remaining few moments, like to make any comments about how it is now organized and managed? Well, the only thing I can tell you is second-hand hearsay, but I have checked with AT&T. At the time that I left the White House, I owed AT&T approximately $300,000, which I was waiting for invoices. AT&T has told me to this day that it's never been paid, that the White House Travel Office is indebted to them hundreds of thousands of dollars, so they wouldn't tell me how much. Uh, they shouldn't have told me that they were indebted, probably. When I can call their accounting department, and my name is on these bills, it's easy enough for me to find out what is still outstanding from when I was in the office. And if I remember correctly, my checkbook balance when I left the White House travel office was somewhere over $600,000. I had invoices that we had submitted to the press corps, we probably brought in another million dollars, I mean, I would just wonder what happened to that money. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true that they balanced the checkbook for the first time in eight months just before the 1995 GAO report? That's, I, I heard that, yes, and found approximately $200,000 that they had deposited in the bank and didn't know about. Well, time has expired. Thank, thank you, Mr. Dale. I'm now uh, recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I share your concern about the way the White House fired uh, these seven employees at the White House Travel Office. Uh, it is my understanding that the White House had every right, if it chose to do that, when they came into office, for political reasons, to say, we don't want you. We want other people. And I don't think there's any dispute over that. But it is also my understanding that the White House inappropriately fired them, quote unquote, for cause. Uh, suggesting that there was financial mismanagement when, in fact, that may not have been the case. And to the degree that the White House did that, clearly what the White House did was inappropriate and it was wrong. Mr. Chairman, um, my concern is not that we should not take a hard look at what happened to these people. Uh, but my concern is that we should take a look at all issues that impact federal employees in a nonpartisan way and in perspective. Uh, for example, 
Mr. Chairman, I note today that in the Hill newspaper front page, headline, House hands pink slips to 113 postal workers. Quote, less than a day before the Congressional Accountability Act took effect Tuesday, the House Chief Administrative Officer Office fired all but six of the 119 post office workers making room for a private company to take over the House postal operations next month. The 113 mailroom employees received notice of their dismissal just hours before a deadline for accepting an offer from Pitney Bowes Management Service, et cetera, just hours. Mr. Chairman, that's 113 workers. Are we going to have a hearing on that as well? To the degree that these people were wrong, so have other federal employees been wrong. Mr. Chairman, recently, as you know, 750,000 federal employees were either furloughed, sent home without pay, or were forced to work without pay. These people have suffered pain and embarrassment and financial problems as a result of what the White House may have done to them. But so did hundreds of other, hundreds of thousands of federal workers who did not receive the paychecks that they were entitled to. Some of those folks may not have been able to pay their mortgage on time. Some of them may have lost their homes. Some of them may have paid their tuition payments late. Are we going to take a look at what happened to hundreds of thousands of federal employees who were sent home without pay? Mr. Chairman, recently there have been cuts in federal programs that go to homeless people. How do homeless people survive if there are not going to be housing shelters or affordable housing available to them? How do hungry Americans get by if federal aid to nutrition programs are cut? The only point that I am trying to make, Mr. Chairman, is not on the line, not to defend what happened to these people. It sounds to me that they were treated unfairly, and it sounds to me that a misjustice was done to them, and that is wrong. Nobody should apologize to them. But, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that this committee is used in a nonpartisan way to take a look at all of the misjustices, all of the miscarriages of justice that take place to all of our federal employees. And I hope that we can broaden our inquiry and broaden our scope and take a look at other problems that federal employees are facing as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. And I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays, for Thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm ashamed of this committee, but only for one reason, that we aren't having people on the other side asking questions that need to be asked. And I know that when I served on the HUD investigation as a freshman and new member on the Republican side, and we looked at HUD, and we looked at the Republican administration, I had some of my Republicans say, well, you know, Democrats look at Democrats and Republicans look at Republicans. But I felt, and a lot of other people felt, we should just look at the issue. And I apologize first to you, Mr. Dale. I represent a part of this government, but on behalf of whatever part of this government I represent, I apologize to you. I apologize to your wife. I apologize to your children. And for each of you here, I apologize for whatever part of this government I represent, because I'm also ashamed of this government now that I serve in and that I deeply love. I'm ashamed of an administration that, who had totally the right to fire each and every one of you. You knew when you got the job, you weren't hired as a civil servant. You weren't protected by civil servant laws. But you at least knew that if you were let go, they would just do it. We didn't know that they would use the IRS and the FBI to get you to do it and justify it for cause. Now, I will tell you what I'm troubled by, Mr. Dale. I'm troubled that only you and one other person had control of money. I think that's a recipe for a disaster. And you may be an extraordinarily honest man, and you are guilty of no crime. But what a temptation. And so that process is wrong, and it shouldn't exist. So you change the process. And what I'm somewhat ambivalent now is, yes, we're going to get the IRS here, and we're going to get, we're going to get the FBI here, and we're going to say, well, how could you have done this? And what they're going to do is they're going to work harder than ever to prove that each and every one of you is guilty, because now they have to defend themselves. So, Mr. Dale, in a way, you can't even speak out, because now the, the, the IRS is investigating you. And what, a, what an, un, a, an incredibly outrageous position to put you, so, to put you in. I'd like to know from each of you how much you have had to spend to defend yourself. And I'm going to start from my right to the left. 
Uh, I'm one of the fortunate ones. Uh, I am not out of pocket uh, anything. Via okay, let's, I don't want to waste my time. You, you came out whole. You were just a cruise to being a crook. But other than that, you know, okay. The appropriation Mr. Wright? was sufficient. $6,000. $6,000? I have uh, yet to be reimbursed for approximately 4000 But you will be reimbursed? Mr. Dale? Out of my pocket so far, I have spent $105,535, and I have faced legal bills of approximately another $300,000. No, tell me, so far you have spent how much? $105,535. And, and how much is owed now? Well, I, I think my attorney has sympathy on me. He hasn't submitted his final bill to me yet, but approximately $300,000. Okay. So you got about four hundred thousand dollars. So well, when you win, you lose. In there's the, in also this a legal defense fund that was set up, and it's paid close to a hundred thousand dollars. So the legal bills were in the neighborhood of five hundred thousand dollars, as I've been told. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Mr. Sweeney. My total uh, was sixty-five thousand, of which I've already been reimbursed uh, about thirty-five. And, and, and will you be reimbursed for the remaining? We have hopes. Okay. Who reimburses you for this? The Congress. Because. Someone screwed you, and we have to make up for it? That's correct. I had a uh, total of about $34,000 in the uh, transportation funds that were uh, allocated uh, covered all of my legal expenses. I had approximately $44,000, and $34,000 was covered by the uh, DOT appropriation. Now, Mr. Dale, I just want to go through this, this plea bargain issue. I'm really sorry we have to bring it up, because that is confidential information. And once again, they not only went after you to try to prove that you were a crook, but afterwards they then tried to say that you, you, know, you were trying to do a plea bargain, so you must have been a crook and that your, your vindication is somehow tainted. My understanding is this, that basically you were just going to acknowledge the fact that you had put money in your account. You were not acknowledging in any way that you had done anything crooked. Is that correct? That's correct. We told the Justice Department if they wanted jail time, that we would admit that I commingled funds and that I would agree to serve two to four months in jail if that's what they wanted because I had been told or had been estimated that my legal expenses could exceed $450,000 in the anguish of going through a trial. And I didn't want to put my family through that. Unless and and I it is possible, it. Mr. Dale, isn't it, that you could have been in the innocent and be found guilty and you had to recognize that was a fact, too? That's true. but. In my plea bargain, I told him under no circumstances would I agree that I stole any money or used any travel office money in any manner except what it was meant to be, be used now, for. Mr. Dale and Mr. Wright, you handled the money. Would Mr. Sweeney, uh, representing the rest, you did not handle money, is that correct? No, sir. Why were you considered a crook? Because the only way they could bring in the people from Arkansas was to clean out the entire office, including the telegraph side. That was the only re way they could do it. You, I, I want to hear from each of the individuals beside Mr. Dale and Mr. Wright. Did any of you, uh, I'd like to go down, did any of you handle money? No, Collect sir, money, I, reimburse it, put it in the accounts, and so on? No, sir, I, I handled uh, very few dollars uh, of the okay, petty I have cash. Okay, I'm running out of time. I'm sorry, very few dollars. Very few dollars of the petty cash. When a trip was out, uh, um, bus drivers, uh, okay. what have you, we'd uh, give Tiny them dollars. an opportunity. Mr. Wright, you handled money next? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. I helped with some of the accounting practices, but I had no uh, financial responsibility, meaning I couldn't sign a check. You did the bookkeeping. I, I helped with some of the uh, bookkeeping, check uh, logging. Mr. Check Sweeney? Out. Same. We, I did the uh, bookkeeping, but had no financial responsibility at all. I had the same, but I think all of us did uh, have petty cash responsibilities when we would do a trip or go in advance. But other than that, have any of you? Yes, sir. Yes, and as I stated in my statement, uh, part of my responsibilities was making a bank deposit for the press travel fund that uh, they ranged anywhere from seventy-two to five hundred fifty-five thousand dollars. Thank but you very much. No petty cash. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the gentleman here today, I. I'm sorry that you had to go through what you went through. I think it's unfair whenever any individual has to incur legal expenses to defend their good name. And I'm sorry that happened. Uh, in retrospect, I think that there were mistakes that were made. Having said that, I look at the letter 
of May 17, 1993, from Mr. Kennedy, or to Mr. Kennedy, from Pete Marwith. And I look at that letter, just take a couple minutes, and I look at that letter, and I assume all of you have seen that. And I would guarantee to each of you that had this administration not done something, and had this letter come to the attention of some or many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they would have been yelling to the high heavens about how inept the Clinton administration is, how there was a scandal in the White House travel office, and that something had to be done now. And I say that because, un unfortunately, that's the reality of the way things work in this town. When I'm back in my district in Wisconsin, people ask me what the difference is between Washington and serving in the state legislature in Wisconsin. And I tell them, Washington is just a mean place. It's a mean town, and that's the way it is. You have to, you have to understand that. I don't particularly like the fact that it's mean. But I, I would bet that, that most, if not all of you, would agree with me that, that had the Republicans seen what Pete Marwick said, whether it's correct or not correct, and I, and I understand, Mr. Dale, where you, you vigorously dispute that, that they would, have, they would have made political hay out of that. I think you would agree with that, don't you? Well, I don't know, because I've never been in a political fight like this before. Well, I, then, then perhaps you can accept my, my presentation, that, I, that I, think, I think that they would do that. Would, if you got this letter, would you give me an opportunity to defend myself? I was never given an opportunity to answer one question until I took the witness stand in my trial approximately 30 months later. I, I probably would have. And again, that's why I say that I think that there were some mistakes that were there. And I, and I frankly think that it was clear that, that the Clinton administration wanted to bring its own people in. Uh, and I think, again, we all recognize that they could do that, that this was not the appropriate way to, to do it, having it tied in with this. I don't think that it was. But, but I understand why that happened. Now, at the same time, I, I, I certainly agree with Mr. Sanders that I am, as I said, I'm sympathetic. I don't think you were treated fairly. But I don't think that, that this snapshot where we see your faces and that you all look like good people tells the whole story. Because what's going on right now in this building is that we're seeing, as the Hill says this morning, 113 postal workers who have lost their jobs, who I, I imagine were very good workers too. Mr. Barrett, can you name one of them that turned on a television set to hear himself accused of being a thief? No, and Thank again, you, I, I am not defending. But I, I can tell you that I will bet that these 113 workers are not getting jobs in other parts of the civil service. Well, and I feel Barrett, sympathetic. May the 19th. I'm sorry. Mr. Dale. And I feel sympathetic for them. Again, I'm, I'm not here to attack any of you. I think you're good people. I think you're very good people. And, and I think it's unfortunate that this happens. But my point is it's happening to other people. And these people have families to support. Mm -hmm. When Mr. Maughan said that three of your fathers died and before you had a chance to have your names cleared, that pulled at my heartstrings. I, I think that would be terrible to have your father die and not have a chance to have your, your name filled. When I hear Mr. Maughan say that he's served the government 42 years, eight months, my reaction was, this guy served the government longer than I've been alive. Uh, my, my hat's off to you, and I think, I think that you're good people. But, but I think it's unfortunate that you're, that you're caught up in this. But, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided fight, frankly. And the day following the election in 1994, I also served on the banking committee, and I had to speak to some banking officials in my district. I said, I can't make a lot of guarantees because of the new Congress, but I'll make one guarantee to you. We will have two years of, Watergate, or of white water hearings. And, I'll, and they'll culminate shortly before the election. And frankly, I would have said the same thing about this issue. I'm sure every single one of you wants to put this behind you and get on with your lives. And again, I'm sympathetic. I feel sorry for you. I think all of you know this is going to drag on for another two or three months. Mr. Barry, election. can you assure me that you'll advise Mr. Bennett of I, how you feel? I don't know who Mr. Bennett is. Mr. Bennett is the president's lawyer who has accused us again of of some more illegalities. I, I certainly will contact his office Thank and you. see the basis for that. Thank you. I I'm not going to give advice to the, the president's legal counsel if he I knows things it. I don't. But I just want you to know how I feel. But I, I think that we have to understand the context of what's going on here. This is hardball politics from, from both sides. You're caught in it. These 113 postal workers are caught in it. The people who are in, involved in the committees are going on across the hall and across the hill for Whitewater are going on it too. Would I like to see it end? I would. I think it would be better for the American people. 
if we put it behind him. I think it would be better for your lives if we put this behind you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barrett. I would just point out for the record that we have been requesting documents and information about this matter since June of 1993. I would agree with the gentleman from Wisconsin. I would have loved to have had this over and done with a long time ago, but there has been recalcitrance on the part of those we try to get information from. And I would now recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Schiff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think we should make it clear that if if there was any lax financial accounting procedures in the travel office, and that's a matter of some debate, but if there were, that is not the reason why any of the individuals seated in front of us were fired. Uh, the proof of that is several fold. First is, uh, why fire all seven of these individuals, since it is obvious that only one or perhaps two had clear responsibility for financial management? So if the object was to clean up financial mismanagement, there would be no reason to terminate those employees who were simply following instructions of their superiors. Yet, of course, we know all seven were terminated. Second of all, it seems to me that if any kind of lax accounting procedures were reason to terminate people at the White House, uh, the White House Travel Office, uh, if I'm reading the General Accounting Office report that was just completed at your request correctly, uh, there are lax accounting procedures there today that are outlined in this report. And I think the classic has to be that, um, uh, the classic has to be that according to the General Accounting Office, <coughs> excuse me again, the, uh, the White House Travel Office had not balanced their checkbook, hadn't done what every American individual and, and, and business normally does each month for the period from January of 1995 to August of 1995. They did it very hurriedly when they heard the GAO was coming, and lo and behold, found $200,000. They didn't, and had not entered in their checkbook. Yet the people responsible for that now are apparently still working there. In fact, if, if travel financial management is that important to this administration, it seems to me if press reports can be believed that there are two cabinet members who probably should be looking for a job right now. Now, the real reason why these individuals were fired is that there was a political agenda to change their employment from these individuals to a substitute group friendlier to this administration political allies of this administration. I think the evidence is overwhelming, particularly after Mr. Watkins' testimony before us a short time ago, that from the highest echelons of the Clinton administration, the emphasis was on a plan to put in allies. I think, the, I think uh, Mr. Watkins' recollection was in a direct conversation uh, with Mrs. Clinton, uh, we need the slots. We need to get their people out and our people in. I'm sure these people, these people who have been there for years didn't realize that they were somebody's people, at least in somebody's mind. But the fact of the matter is uh, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, this termination occurred because of a political agenda. Now, I want to stop right here and, and, and emphasize that the question has been raised another number of times. In essence, so what? Uh, the fact of the matter is that these positions could be terminated at the pleasure of the president. All these employees knew it. And in fact, politics being what it is, uh, there are times when both Democrats and Republicans have made changes in employment in certain positions for what might be considered political reasons. Uh, I'm not here to defend the practice, but I can distinguish it. There is no example I can think of in a change of personnel with a change of administration or a change of the majority in Congress that was accompanied by a false set of charges to, de to besmirch the reputations of longstanding fine government employees. If changes were made for the reasons cited, that a, a, a new majority, a new administration wanted their own people in office, that's what was stated. And it can be certainly criticized for that reason. But it still is, is, is immensely different from the idea of charging, and in my judgment, misusing law enforcement, such as announcing an FBI investigation, which it was, it was totally improper to do. I can tell you that as a career prosecutor. The FBI never confirms or denies that it's doing, uh, doing an investigation. Uh, that there was an investigation here. And I want to, to continue to say that uh, the suggestion has also been made that, uh, well, that was a mistake made early on in May of 1993, and the administration really uh, wouldn't continue to do that, uh, act in that fashion. The problem is that's exactly what they've been doing. Uh, charges continue to be leveled uh, up till the present time against one or more of these employees. And there continues, there has been a resistance to providing documents and information uh, as the chairman pointed out, we're still having these hearings because we've 
requested documents for years that are just now suddenly materializing. So I think there is a major difference here in, in, in what we are examining as this committee and, and other kinds of changes in personnel. And to conclude on this point, I would say that uh, those who might be watching on C-SPAN or through other electronic uh, device know they didn't see Mr. Watkins' testimony on C-SPAN or in any other electronic form because he pulled the plug. He had the legal right to do so. But if there's any question about the propriety of what happened in the travel office, the fact that the White House official who did the firings took sort of an electronic Fifth Amendment should answer everybody's question about uh, whether it was appropriate or not. Mr. McSweeney, with my, rest, with my remaining time, I'd like to go to you first, and then perhaps Mr. Dale or anyone else. You stated that you were reimbursed your salary but called a thief. I believe those were your words. Am I remembering right? I, I was re, uh, the question, I believe, was that we had been given new, uh, another job, so I, I did continue to draw a salary, but I had been labeled a thief. I think that was what I was replying to. Did, did that mean something to you? Yes, it did, and to my family. Well, can you explain that? Uh, I think it's self-evident. I'm, I'm not one usually that's intimidated. The Irish in me, uh, I, I've been in a, for two and a half years, I've had a rage inside of me that I hope someday to have either Mac McClarty or someone of authority at the White House. I have never had anyone tell me why I was fired. And I, I, I would like to do that. Mr. Dale, did you want to add to that? Any, any of the other? Uh... No, I can't follow him that well. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> All right, any of the other witnesses want to add on that? I mean, it's been suggested you got new jobs or offered new jobs. Basically, what are you complaining about? I mean, that's what, that's what I've been hearing. Anyone want to explain what they were complaining about real quickly? Well, the most ironic thing about me is that I had my papers in to retire. I had met with David Watkins two days before we were fired and, and notified him of my intentions to retire on June the 3rd. He didn't give me an opportunity. Um, very quickly, anyone else want yes, to respond sir, to I, the yeah, same question? I, one of the things about the whole thing is you felt like all these institutions of the government that seemed to be... Uh, for you have not been there for you. And uh, it, it, it's uh, just disappointing and depressing, even though I will admit that there have been elements that have been there for us with our uh, legal fees. The gentleman's Thank time you, has sir. expired. I would just notify that we will break at about 2 o'clock uh, for lunch since the cafeteria is going to close at 2.30. So I, we will have a few more uh, questions here. And I would now recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Thurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I too, you are certainly the youngest, Ms. Meek, no question in my mind. <laughs> At least acting, I know that. Um, I think all of us are, are concerned about how this was handled and at any time sympathetic. And, and of course, we've all dealt with it in a political scheme through campaigns and elections. And I too can tell you, maybe to the, not, to the same extreme that you have, but certainly my children have come home concerned about an ad on the radio that has been used against me to make me be something that I'm not. So trust, I mean, I, I absolutely can appreciate that concern of your family and those that are surrounding around you and that feeling that you've done nothing wrong, but it's a 30 second ad and let's go at it. So Mr. Dale, what I, what I would like to know though, and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, do the same thing that Ms. Maloney was. I'm, I'm interested in making government more efficient and to work. I think that should be what this committee is about. It's reform and it's oversight. Um, in reviewing the GAO report, um, there was in the first part past reviews of the travel office that they've talked about as far back as 1980 or 1982, I believe. Um, and they said that according to the Director of Administration in the EOP from 1981 to 1985, OMB reviewed the operations of the White House Travel Office in 1981 or in 1982. Uh, there's a footnote to that that says that the former Director of Administration said that he no longer had a copy of the review, but that it should be available in the Reagan Presidential Library. And at our request, the White House Counsel 
office asked the Reagan and Bush presidential libraries to search for records of this report. However, so far, neither library staff was able to find it. So we are missing a document to some degree. But it goes on, and I think this is important. It says the former director of administration said that he did recall and that he did not suspect the travel office of engaging in any wrongdoing, but that he was interested in good management. And goes on to say that according to the former director of administration, the review found no evidence of criminal wrongdoing, but did reveal lack of accounting practices that had the potential for fraud and substantial excess of cash. I think that you talked about this on your $25,000 issue and in the travel office checking account. The former director of administration instructed that the excess balance in the checking account be refunded to the press, which I believe you did take that step, and that the director of the travel office at the same time, at, at that time, retired, and the former director of administration told us that if the travel office director had not retired, he would have been removed. According to an employee of the office at the time, a new travel office director was appointed who was an acquaintance of a senior official in the new Reagan administration. We were told by an employee of that travel office at that time that the new director didn't work out and was re replaced after a few months by an experienced travel office staff member who served as the director of, until May 1993. My assumption is that that is you. you. What I would like to know in the time with that kind of beginning uh, of you coming into that, can you give us some ideas of the steps that you took other than the $25,000 issue that would have made the management of this office in their terms, um, I guess it was, um, in interested in good management? What did you bring into this office to change that and the reason I ask that is because some of what's happening today may not have happened if we could have, if we go back and review what we've done to where we are today and what we need to do to move on. Okay, when I <clears throat> took over the office, there, were no, there was no tracking system. There were no petty cash logs. I instituted a petty cash log where each and every penny of the petty cash was accounted for. I instituted logs where that every check that came into the office, let me clarify that, every check for the press travel fund from the news organizations that came into the office it was logged into a received log. Every invoice that came into the office was logged into, the, uh, receive, into another received log. And when those invoices were paid, that log was completed, the invoice was placed in the proper trip folder, and there was a log for every financial transaction that took place in that office. Okay. In response then to uh, Pete Marwick or whatever, since the chairman has made the, the mention of that this is the opportunity for you to give your side, how would you respond then based on your testimony just then of, of what the criticisms were or the issues that they raised and some of the accounting issues so that Again, if this committee were to look at this or to look at overview, what would you suggest where they might have been miss? And I, I will tell you that I think it's very difficult sometimes for anybody to come in and look at an office that does not deal with it on an everyday basis and understand it totally. But on the other side, they did raise some very, some issues that we should be concerned about, and particularly so that we don't see this happen in government again. Okay. The concerns that I'm aware of that they raised were that uh, they could not put their hands on logs at that time. And I've never hidden the fact that some of my records were missing when they came in there, and some of them I didn't know about until they asked me for them. Uh, Catherine Cornelius has admitted that she took files home with her. I don't know to this day what files she's talking about. But if you want to go to the Pete Marwick report, I would suggest that you turn to page six. I don't have that in front of me, but go ahead. But they, they list a number of checks going back to 1991, which they said was not logged in on the petty cash logs. I question how they knew that if they did not have access to the petty cash logs. And then they come down in a, in a paragraph here, and they state that they did not 
have the petty cash logs, so they don't know whether these were logged in or not. So they had, in my opinion, they had an agenda when they came in there. They, they had to find something to justify this report. Mr. Chairman, um, just in a, if, if we could, from as a formal request of this committee, um, continue to look for those audit reports that are noted within the GAO, I think that would be a service to this committee as we go forward in looking at similar issues throughout our government. And I would, I would, I would hope that these things are not lost, that they should have been ar archived someplace. I would hope so as well. Thank you. Gentlemen, we will continue. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Gilman. Who is, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, Mr. Dale, prior to, uh, to your firing, how often had you met with your supervisors, Patsy Thompson or David Watkins or D.D. Myers? I'd only met with one of them. That was David Watkins, and that was the five weeks or so before when he called me to his office to notify me that he was going to install Catherine Cornelius in the office to work and learn the travel business. And that was the extent of your meeting? That was the extent of my meeting. I was unsuccessful in arranging meetings with any of them, although I tried. You made requests of all of them? I made requests on either the afternoon of Inauguration Day as the press office was getting settled in, or the next day I went to George Stephanopoulos' office because it's always been my tradition or the tradition of the office to introduce yourself to the people that you most closely interact with in the administration. Requested a meeting with him to introduce myself. His secretary or assistant told me that she would get back to me. Did any of your supervisors, Mr. Dale, ever raise the issue of financial mismanagement or concerns of these concerns with you? Did anyone ever ask you for any accounting or explanation about how or why you did what you did? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Dale, did you ever get any lucrative stock options or futures options as a result of your public position? <laughs> no, sir. And Mr. Dale, did Ultra Air ever pay kickbacks to any of the White House Travel Office employees, as far as you know? No, sir. And I ask that of all the panelists, did any of you receive any kickbacks? No, no, sir. no, sir. no, no yes answer amongst any of them. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'll be pleased to yield to the gentleman from Indiana. Real briefly, I think one point that has not been made that really should be made is at the closed hearing when Mr. Watkins testified, he verified every one of his notes. He did not deny anything that was in those notes. And so the question about the, the First Lady's uh, uh, determination to be involved and to get rid of you folks has not been denied by the man who did the firing. So that was verified, and I'm sorry that the American people didn't get a chance to see that. Say, see that. One other thing I want to point out is it's been, it's been stated that there's a parallel between your firings and the dismissal of other people in the government here at the congressional level or in the post office and so forth. The fact of the matter is your honor was tainted. Your integrity was tainted. That didn't happen with the others. It's unfortunate they lost their jobs, but there were reasons for that. But you were accused of being crooked. In our Declaration of Independence, our forefathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor because the only thing they considered sacred was their honor. And when you destroy a man's honor and integrity, you've in effect destroyed him. And that's the real problem here. They've tried to attack your honor. Uh, this, in my opinion, by the White House was not an investigation. It was an inquisition. And we're going to continue and get, get to the bottom of this. And once again, uh, as my colleagues have, we apologize to you for what you've been through. And thank you for yielding. At this point, I'm going to uh, recess the uh, hearing uh, and for 45 minutes and uh, because the cafeteria is going to close. And I think uh, We'll return to the travel office hearing in a moment, but first a program note. Sunday night on our companion network C-SPAN, Prime Minister's questions from the British House of Commons. Prime Minister John Major responds to questions from members of his party and the opposition. That's Sunday at 9 p.m.